Increasingly, we as humans are beginning to grasp the inextricable link between health and planetary health. In other words, the sicker the Earth gets, the sicker we get, vice versa. But this relationship isn't getting the attention it deserves. Our guest today is an artist and activist dedicating his work to spreading awareness and inspiring action. He's an award-winning filmmaker, citizen journalist, and musical activist. This is the story of Earth Conscious Life with Rob Herring. Rob, great to see you. It's awesome to be here, Casper. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you know, you you have your hands in a lot of things, and uh, you know, it's it's it seems that it goes like further and further into un, unraveling the truth of what really health is and and kind of what's going on on our planet. And I know you have this project, the need to grow. Uh, what's been the impact like so far of of like a project like Need to Grow? And explain what the project itself is for the audience. Yeah, so I was working a lot in environmental activism, which inevitably leads into our food system and agriculture as one of the most detrimental impacts on our environment as a whole, as many people know. And after a while, you see many of the most passionate activists burn out. And there, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of blame, rightfully so in many cases. But what I initially saw, you know, when I first started getting into this, when I was in my early 20s, one, I was always the youngest person there. And I thought, why is it that my generation at, at that time really wasn't that interested? And why is it that we're only pointing anger and complaining and marching against things? So. It was it was something that I was just mulling over and thinking, you know, how do we inspire more people to get interested in this? And I think the the way that you bring people in is that it can't be so overwhelming and daunting and doom and gloom, but it has to be focused on solutions. So at that time, we asked ourselves, how are we going to feed people on this planet in a way that is not destroying the earth? And there's so many solutions. And just like, you know, the the solution of biodiversity. I think the solutions themselves are diverse because that's how nature does things. There isn't one quick fix for everything. And so my filmmaking partner and I, Ryan Weirich, we, we kind of went on this experiment to say, are there interesting enough solutions that would be captivating? So we were really focusing initially on urban agriculture. You know, how are we going to feed this density of population? Maybe it's rooftop farming or indoor vertical farming and all of these new technologies that we thought might pique people's interest. And as we went on this journey, we very quickly realized that soil was the underlying issue. And it's been awesome to see over this last 10 years how much soil has become in has come into the mainstream conversation in a way that it really wasn't at the time that we started i remember when we would tell people we're making a movie now about soil just the the, the eyes you know blazing over it's like okay this is the nerdiest thing you could possibly do but what's fascinating through the film that we did was we really focused on the humanity of these three stories they're three very different people that are approaching this food system crisis from three very different solutions and for us we thought that was a, a beautiful example of how anybody can get involved at any age no matter what resources they have at their fingertips and no matter what they've done beforehand or participated in solutions in any other way. And so what was so cool was to learn about the potential of soil as a solution. And just, you know, some of these bigger points are that we've, we're, we're degrading our soil as we farm and extract. Mm -hmm. And so these conventional means of agriculture, but even organic means of agriculture are not necessarily regenerating soil. So organic we know is really about what's not there. It's not using certain chemicals and pesticides, but it doesn't mean that they have more soil, more healthy soil at the end of the season. So what's even more important at this stage is actually looking beyond organic into what now people think of as regenerative agriculture, which means that this soil medium is, is actually you know being increased. And what that comes down to are the microbes. And so there's this cosmos of microbes happening, you know, in a, a teaspoon of soil, we can have billions upon billions of microbes. It's tens of thousands of different species. And that can seem a little too scientific and nerdy, but, you know, we know more about space and, and the cosmos in the skies than we do about this micro uh, cosmic, you know, galactic inter complexity of species that really is at the basis of all of our life. 
And so I, I want to inspire more people to get interested in this. You know, instead of just looking through the telescope to the stars, we have this beautiful planet right here. And the, the foundation of all life really comes down to these microbes. And so if we can farm in a way that is actually protecting them, respecting them, then we see this beautiful cascade of solutions. It's not just limited to food, but obviously we're going to protect the farmers from poisons and chemicals, which is a huge crisis. The farmers that are you know, poisoning themselves in order to get the job done. But we're going to protect the waterways from the leakage of these pesticides, from either irrigation or rainwater runoff. It's poisoning the rivers. It's going down into the oceans. We're going to create more nutrient-dense food. So when we farm in a way that respects these microbial processes, what happens is the, the exchange between the plants is more optimized. And so now these minerals that are more available in the soil become more available in the plant, they're more available to us. And we know that humans are so deficient at this point, a big piece of that is because we've depleted our soils. Then you look at the wildlife in the surrounding areas, so the biodiversity to thrive. You know, the insects, the butterflies, and the bees get a lot of attention, but really it cascades much further beyond that, obviously. It's a whole interconnected web. And then we're looking at the ability to, you know, recycle carbon, whether, you know, that means that we're actually storing it in the ground where it's supposed to be, because just by tilling, we're actually releasing some of that carbon into the atmosphere. But then, you know, we're, we're just, we're affecting pretty much every single solution. And the, the last one that is coming to mind right now is the water storage. Mm -hmm. So not just are we only uh, protecting the waters from being polluted, but we're actually storing water in the landscape. And we can't emphasize enough how critical this is. If anybody is concerned about the future of the planet, I highly recommend that we do a deeper dive and raise more awareness about the water cycles. This you know, might be more of a key to thriving ecosystems and increasing biodiversity than almost anything because we're desertifying. So people have heard this desertification. We look at places around the world that used to be lush and green, they're over-extracted and they're desertified. So now nothing can grow in there, but this medium is now dirt. And there's a huge difference between dirt and soil. It's that microbial life. So when those microbes are back there, when we increase the organic matter, even by the tiniest percent on, let's say, an acre of land, we can actually store 20 to 30,000 more gallons of water. So this is going to reduce drought and flood because that water actually holds in the landscape like a sponge. And if we're talking about protecting not just humans, but all life on Earth, we really have to keep that water where it's supposed to be. And that's going to become, unfortunately, an increasing crisis of how we you know, navigate who's using water for what. So I think we'll start hearing a lot more about the water cycle in the future. Yeah, it's incredible how much we overlook something like soil, like the earth, we're all stale, we're all a foundation of, right? Even the, and, and we just pour over it usually, right? There's just so much concrete. Some people don't even see like, or step in soil at all during the day, which is kind of wild, right? A hundred years ago, it was all just soil and dirt and good stuff too. But when you hear people say things like, we only have 60 years of topsoil left, what does that mean to you? Can you explain that? Yeah, this this figure, you know, like anything else, is really an estimate at current rates of depletion. Right. And it's such a complex idea that no one is going to pretend that this is an exact figure or that it wouldn't change because obviously what we do tomorrow and in the years coming is going to affect that. So I don't want anyone to ever hear a stat like that and think that means that it's set in stone. Yeah. But the idea, you know, really circles back to this concept of sustainability that has become so overused. But we really want to remember that if something is, quote, unsustainable, that it has an actual expiration date. It will run out at the, at the rate in which we're using it up if we're not cautious about regenerating. And so when we're in this extraction mentality, unfortunately, because of the way that, you know, uh, our whole economy works, we have to actually increase we're always in this chase to increase, increase, increase production. But the paradox is that it's always at the cost of extraction. And so when we're looking at how the topsoil is depleted, what that means is we're only extracting. We're, we're doing farming systems that are not helping to increase that physical layer of topsoil. 
And this is, you know, physical layer that is loaded with these billions upon billions of microbes, but it's also loaded with these minerals and vitamins that are then going to be accessible to the plants. So you can watch farms actually be degraded to the point where they can't grow food anymore. And you can prop things up on a little bit of a crutch as you start to deplete those systems by adding in artificial fertilizers, adding in artificial chemicals, right? When the pests and weeds start coming in, it's usually a sign from nature that something's wrong and needs to be regenerated, needs to be fixed. And we're blasting those weeds and those pests out of the system. We're not really respecting that, that natural cycle. And eventually the soil can't grow anything. So you can artificially keep pumping in what's, you know, called MPK, these fertilizers that are mostly fossil fuel derived. So there's a whole other backstory of extraction and pollution that's happening there just to get this, this nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, which is unfortunately been pretty narrow minded in the last several decades of, of growing food. And there's so much more to, uh, creating abundance in the food supply than just these synthetic versions of these chemicals. I like to think of them almost as a steroid in the, in the sense that you can blast this in there at high doses and get a growth, but we're growing plants that are more and more fragile because the diversity of you know the minerals and everything is not going to be there. And they're really silhouettes of the plants that they once were. They're not containing the vitamin A, they're not containing the zinc, the magnesium, and all of these other compounds that even you know two or three generations ago we would have had in the same bites of food. So over time, we have land that is just unusable. And then what that means is farmers have to move on to another piece of land. In many cases, that means that they're chopping down more forests to make room for more agriculture. In many cases, it means that this becomes seen as just uh, completely valueless land and they have to move on. So we're forced with coming up with these solutions. Some of them you can do on the small scale, like composting. Some of them you can do on the larger scale, like regenerative agriculture, but ultimately these systems where we're cover cropping, we're actually protecting the life in the soil, protecting it from the elements, from being blasted with too much you know, heat and evaporation of the water, but we're also allowing the root systems to grow deep because this is a big piece of holding that soil in place so that it doesn't irrigate, I mean, so it doesn't uh, erode. Because through irrigation, a lot of times, these soil systems, as they become more fragile, they're losing that life. They're losing that microbial system because they've been poisoned or overextracted. That soil becomes fragile to the sense where when there's a big rainstorm, you will see that soil wash off of that property. And you can even look uh, at neighboring pieces of land that are doing regenerative practices or cover cropping where root systems are helping to aggregate that soil and hold it in place versus conventional farms. And when a big storm comes through, that waterway will be totally brown, loaded with the actual soil and dirt that should be on that farm, but also carrying with it, of course, all of those artificial fertilizers that are going to totally disrupt the water ecosystem, all of those artificial poisons like pesticides and glyphosate has become pretty well known that the, the Roundup chemical. But then you look at those neighboring farms and the water is actually coming off clear um, because that soil is not leaving. Things that are supposed to stay on that landscape are not eroding. So the erosion is a big part of that. It, it happens inevitably in nature, but we've sped up the erosion to such a degree. And eventually we will come to a point, and we're already coming to a point in many places around the world that we can't provide for the resources that we need. And we can kick the can down the road and keep poisoning these systems, keep moving on to the next spot and erode that one and destroy that and extract. But as we all know, eventually you, you reach a dead end where there's, there's nothing left. Uh, the beautiful thing is that nature does regenerate. And so, you know, and we don't want this to be depressing. What we need to know is that the natural systems are such that when you give the slightest nudge and the slightest bit of human intervention can actually speed up the process for regeneration. If you have no human intervention, it will regenerate on its own uh, over time. And it will, and all those species will inevitably come back. 
Uh, you know, we think of like those post-apocalyptic movies where we start to see nature taking back over the cities, right? And this really does happen on a farmland. Eventually, you know, those small early keystone species will start to return and create the opportunity for the next species in that cycle to come along and participate and help regrow. Uh, there's an, another beautiful documentary called Biggest Little Farm that I highly recommend. It's, it pairs greatly with our film, The Need to Grow, because this shows a piece of totally desertified land. And in just a few years, it returns to a Garden of Eden level lushness just by a bit of human, you know, shepherding this system back into play. And I've also, you know, worked with uh, experts like John D. Liu, who do um, these restoration camps around the world. And you can watch video footage of these beautiful transitions that are, you know, maybe five to 10 years between what was totally desertified, empty, just dusty, dirty, can't grow anything. And, you know, crossfade into a beautiful shot of what he's transformed it into. And it's just lush, it's green. There's the water cycle, there's species that have come back. And so earth is designed to do this. Nature is designed to do it. It's just when we kind of either get out of the way or give it a little bit of a loving nudge in the right direction. And we can really regenerate. Oh yeah. I mean, you think of like places like Chernobyl, right? Where, where you look at it today, a, a cataclysmic nuclear type event, and now it is thriving. Like, you, you know, I, I was reading about this and someone at a conference recently was talking about, like, it is the most thriving almost area in all of Russia as far as wildlife, everything just, and you're right, it's just everything is overgrown into, you know, all of the, the abandoned places there. And it is just lush. And, and beautiful, even though there are still isotope there. And, but no, na- nature rebounds beautifully. Now, what, what do you feel? Are we kidding ourselves with this idea that we would have food shortages if we went into biodynamic or regenerative farming? Is that like just a fallacy pushed by conventional farm or, or maybe, I don't know, big food in general? Because you do hear it a lot. And we're seeing it right now, egg shortages, right? Eggs. And most of those are conventional, right? But not many are pasture raised. And even then, you know, those sort of words can be thrown around. But what are your thoughts on this idea that we would have food shortages if we tried to do organic or regenerative farming? Yeah, it's incredibly complex because the illusion is in the this idea of it being binary, as if it was one or the other. Or if you went down one path, it means you would execute it perfectly um, as opposed to the other. So the way that I look at it is nature, nature never centralizes its solutions. And so anything that is leaning more into monopolies or centralization, um, so that could mean companies that are controlling big portions of the food supply. It could mean the just strategies in which we are growing food one way or another. It could mean the actual crop on the landscape that is a monoculture, right? Just growing acres and acres of corn or acres and acres of soy, which in many cases don't even have genetic diversity amongst themselves because they've been genetically engineered. Right. When we see centralization in nature, that that always means you have you know, either a higher chance for corruption on the business sense, because it's more power in in a smaller number of hands, or more instability and chance for collapse. So diversifying is always possible. The illusion is that there is no power amongst, you know, the, the individuals on a larger scale to have fully diversified systems. We know that, for instance, you know, during World War II, we were growing food in our own backyards. This is possible because it's, it's land, just like anywhere else. And with a little bit of attention and love and care, we were, you know, reportedly producing about 40% of the nation's food in backyard gardens. And now we've dropped that 40% number down to, I think it's 0.1% of the food of this country is coming from gardens because people aren't doing it. So one, they're not taught how to do it. And, you know, they're not incentivized or encouraged in, in any way. They don't believe that they can. So we know that these solutions are possible on a, on a huge um, individualized, diversified, you know, situation. But we also see that if you are to force a solution 
in the wrong conditions, you can have problems. So if you were to, let's say like in Sri Lanka, there's a lot of conflicting stories when they tried to you know, switch their entire country over to organic. Well, a lot of these farmers have built their systems around types of inputs like these chemicals. They know how to do it a certain way. It's not necessarily that these people are intentionally trying to degrade land if someone is using glyphosate. You know, they're growing in the way that meets their, their bottom line so that they don't lose their farm. I mean, most of these people are just barely getting by financially. So to pull out some of the, you know, the cogs in their wheel that they're used to using in their system to manage it, and if you don't provide the right transition period, well, of course, that's going to fail. And so a lot of people were, you know, not ready for this switch. And in Sri Lanka, there's there's a lot of people are using this as evidence that, hey, look, see, it didn't work. You know, they, they tried to switch to organic, but the fact is it wasn't implemented well. Like you can have a great idea, but if you don't, you know, have a have the right strategy or if you force it. I mean, imagine somebody who's been on a certain medication for a long time that a doctor may have an idea that they could safely get off that medication. It's not usually the cold turkey approach of you're just going to dramatically switch your lifestyle and everything overnight. Because there could be other, you know, just complexities and and risks. So I think we see this binary conversation, but the fact is, you know, nature always has the way to do things that will have a more long term benefit for both humans and uh, biodiversity at large and wildlife at large. If we try to force it, for instance, a lot of farmers, you know, they can't even switch to organic if they wanted to in the United States because it takes three years for that land to even be certified organic for one. Mm -hmm. And they don't have the financial means to switch some of these processes. You know, some of it is cheaper um, labor wise and input wise initially to keep those systems in place. So they're looking at the next quarter. How am I going to, how am I going to make ends meet? I can't afford to do this. So if we don't provide the right, you know, financial support, educational support, um, resources, then they're not going to be able to, to transition successfully. But when those farmers are given those resources over the, you know, one to three year mark, usually we start to see that their water inputs are lower. Well, oh, they're saving money now on water. We start to see that you know they don't need those inputs of those pesticides anymore. So they're saving money there. We start to see they're actually growing more abundant food. So they have a higher crop yield that is more resilient to excess heat. We they've they're more resilient to flood and drought. So now they're their business is actually more resilient. Their, their finances are going to be more resilient. And then they can usually sell that food at a premium because it's you know poison-free and healthier, more nutrient-dense, which a lot of people are looking for. So their business model does turn into more profit, but it is it's that gap. You know, it's taking that leap that it's not even about them taking a leap of faith. For some, for so many farmers, they literally cannot do it. Um, without outside support. And we're we're in a system right now that financially subsidizes and encourages the, you know, the degenerative models when we really could have leadership that is pushing us towards diversifying and regenerating. It's actually not that hard of a concept. It's just that, of course, lobbying power and everything that is in, in place in this system is keeping those tax dollars. You know, we're really, it's our own money. It's the citizens' money going to these systems that are that are eroding our own country and the planet, and it's it's really infuriating because it, it does get a bit into the politics of it. You can't totally separate that. Yeah, it's it's a it is an infuriating type type of topic when you see it, not just in let's say farming, but of course in medicine and big pharma, where we encourage or the top leaders, of government, the policies encourage sick profits meaning you will profit more if we keep people sick rather than the opposite, which is completely true. I agree in, in medicine, this idea, well, you wouldn't be able to make, like, no, healthy people spend more money on healthy things. They do more healthy experience and will spend more on food then because they realize what they put into them, the quality matters that much more. So you could actually make more profit, but it's easier to keep someone sick and dependent on you and just keep that whole thing going, the whole charade in a sense. Switching topics, you have another movie coming out, Pharmacy of Life. 
talk to us about that. Because again, pharmacy is not the pharmacy you're thinking of. It's F-A-R-M, right? What, what is that about? Yeah, pharmacy of light is really about how the sun is such a critical part of not just agriculture, but human health. And there is always an overlap, you know, just to the analogy that you were referring to there with with the pharmaceutical model, it's it is really the same thing with pesticides. You know, the 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 landscape is is like the human in this case. We're seeing disease or illness in people, chronic disease, but also in our ecosystems. And and it makes a lot of money to keep people in that system where they're relying on these inputs, whether it's the chemical pesticides or it's you know the chemical pharmaceuticals. Now with pharmacy of light, we we're looking at, you know, what is it about light that is making plants activate different expressions of their resilience and actually storing what we can call photonic energy, photon meaning, right, these little packets of light. And what's amazing is that this isn't something you hear about often in the mainstream, but the light that exists within our bodies, many people might think is kind of a woo-woo concept, but in reality, there's light energy moving through our bodies. If you could- It's Albert Pop, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, he's featured in, in the film. Oh, awesome. And yeah, I love yes. his work. Yeah, so when we look at this, you know, kind of quantum physics, we're realizing that the the- this, this quantum idea is actually showing up in biology because all this physics is happening inside of us as well. And so the light is exchanging within our own cells. And in the plants, when we eat food that is high in this light energy, this light frequency, again, this is stuff that you can measure. This, these, these, these have uh, you know very real scientific backing. This isn't oh, this just kind of enlightened concept. I'm just, uh, you know, believing this idea of enlightenment. This, you know, we can actually measure the freshness of food is how it's often thought of. Some people used to think of it as the life force energy, but in a scientific way, what we're seeing is actually this biophotonic energy, the life of light. And so these photons, of course, are coming down from the sun and through photosynthesis, we know that this energy is being converted into things like carbohydrates and sugars, but is that light being stored? Now, when we pick food, right, when it's harvested, of course, we all know it starts to lose its freshness. And so in the same way, we want to think of food as losing its light energy when it is picked, it starts to lose it, starts to degrade, right? You want to eat things as ripe as possible, as close to being picked as possible, in the need to grow, we actually show, show a clip of this lettuce being broken off and this white milk that is coming out of it. It's some of the most you know anti-carcinogenic compounds that are in the plants, but in 24, 48 hours later, it's gone. And you'll never see it in a romaine, you know, at the store, almost never. Yeah. And so when you eat this, you know, farm to table type, or eat local and support those farmers, you may actually get the chance to, you know, eat the foods that have this really high antioxidant potential. And with that comes this light energy. And so when we consume these photons, they're, they're becoming part of our body. At the same time, the light that is coming from the sun onto us and onto our bodies is, of course, being absorbed, which many people kind of oversimplified it just being vitamin D. Now, vitamin D in and of itself, I'm sure you know a lot about and your audience probably knows a heck of a lot about, uh, you know, as this hormone that, you know, has just almost limitless potential of regulating processes in our body. We probably still don't even know most of what it's doing. But what's really cool is that it's so light, sunlight is so much more than vitamin D, right? And so, We're learning more and more as time goes on in terms of hormone regulation, um, stress response, immune support, and this early morning sunlight, like returning back to these natural cycles or what people would call the circadian rhythm. If we get that early morning sunlight, there was a study, I think it was University of Arizona, that showed this increase in the prefrontal cortex when we had early morning sunlight. That means your mental acuity is going up, you know, your brain fog is going away, your memory is sharper, your ability to strategize and make decisions is is increasing. So it's kind of nature's way of saying, okay, yeah, you're here for the day, 
So, you know, you're ready to participate and we're putting you in the flow of how things are designed to be. For those species that are not participating in the natural flow, they're not there, they're not waking up, they're not actually getting out there and, and into nature. It makes sense that suddenly some of these processes would become more sluggish. They, they would not be as optimized because in natural evolution, kind of, you know, rewarding and enhancing those species that are taking place in the alignment of the order. And so what's really cool is it's also balancing our, our sleep. So you think, well, when I get up and just being exposed to bright sunlight, but for one thing, it's re it's reminding your body what time it is. You're also then going to help balance out those hormones that are present when you should be awake and alert and kind of reset that clock. So then your melatonin is kicking back in at the right time. So, you know, we want to block some of those blue lights people have heard about at night, because the idea is in nature, well, for one thing, there's not really much light at all at night other than moonlight or, or starlight, but these, we see the red spectrum happening. Um, as we wake up in the morning and we, we go more into the blue of the middle of the day, right? The blue sky, if we're lucky, um, it's, it's, it's gray right now, depending on where you are in the middle of winter. But, um, then as, as night goes on, we see that, that gorgeous red, you know, I, I think there's something more to our physiology than just admiring it as beautiful. Anybody that sees a sunset or we start to see that pink in the sky, everybody stops. Hey, look at that, right? I mean, how can you not remind your loved one to look at that? I mean, maybe there are people out there that don't appreciate it. I, I think it's actually built into our genes to a degree to, to have awe for this, right? So I find that fascinating. Why are we drawn to certain types of experiences in nature? They're, they they actually are our, our genetic evolution to want to uh, optimize our health, right? We're being pulled back towards it. So that red light at night heading into sunset, um, this is the opposite end of the spectrum. And so people are learning more about things like red light therapy, just, just incredible. Thousands of studies are on this and, and yet it hasn't really broken into the mainstream in a big way. I think for one, because it wasn't super accessible. The technology uh, was pretty expensive for a long time. It's becoming way more affordable to have at home units. And what we're seeing there is, you know, reduction in inflammation, um, you know, healing wounds faster, brain trauma, uh, healing better, um, hair growth, uh, optimized sleep, of course. I mean, the list goes on and on. Skin, skin healing, just in general of collagen production, things like this. Uh, it's almost a, a one-stop shop where the, the benefits are just innumerable. And I love those kinds of things because when we're trying to inspire people to participate back into solutions, similar to soil, where I looked at it as kind of the multifaceted solution, where just by fixing the soil, we address air quality, water quality, food quality, uh, we're reducing pollution, regenerating, we're fixing the landscape, we're healing wildlife. In a similar way, you know, I'm always drawn to these types of solutions where let's get the most bang for our buck. Um, not just that we even have to pay for it. You can wake up for the sunrise and, and pay attention to the sunset as well. But if you do get a red light therapy device, for instance, or get to try that out, you know, these are the things that are having the most impact for the least amount of time, uh, least invasive, not a huge change to your lifestyle. You can do other things while you're getting red light on you. Yep. Uh, I love that kind of stuff. I just find it so fascinating. So with this new film, Pharmacy of Light, we really want to put out into the conversation. And it, it is the first film I'm aware of that is getting into this quantum biology of how light works within the body. And we can also start to measure light flow, um, you know, showing where light is showing up as relating to the flow of, again, you know, it almost sounds woo woo, but what's cool is that the science is really backing up a lot of what people used to dismiss. Um, you know, this is energy. This is energy moving through the body. This, these are the meridians. This is light moving. And that also means that everything else is, you know, uh, there's no stagnation. And so some people might get acupuncture. You know, it's beautiful to see that this modality is now in hospitals. It's in, it's in mainstream use, which was once this idea that was 
probably seen as as quackery. Also, you know, chiropractic in a way is allowing that that energy to move through the body, right? Preventing that stagnation and blockages. Again, something that was deemed as quackery, now it's becoming pretty well accepted. And so as we think about the light um, and we learn more about quantum physics, which is you know, just starting to tap into all these uh, eerie uh, mysteries. It's it's kind of Pandora's box of, you know, once you, you see what's going on in quantum physics, it, it just rewrites all the rules of of nature and the universe and that's what's so cool about quantum and we're seeing this happen in the body and so i think we need to just look at ourselves you know more than in the way that we look at the 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 galaxies and the universe and say you know there's there's some really cool stuff here happening on the quantum level when it comes to light in the body and it makes sense you know we are beings of nature we're part of nature and there's nothing more critical to life on earth than that big ball in the sky that is powering the whole thing oh yeah uh, i'm like you photobiomodulation has always really really interested me my father used to study in like the 90s early 90s low level laser therapy for pain he started off yeah. in pain chief of pain services and then went into more integrative medicine everything but you know, you see all the magnificent benefits and then you start to understand light is frequency. Frequency is information. You're providing your body with the correct information to regenerate and to optimally perform. That's all we're doing. And it's free, right? It's sunlight, basically. The thing we demonize so much now, sun causes cancer. It's like, no, no, no. I mean, you could say anything in, in abundance, can be disruptive and not good. Anything, you could die from water, you know, too much water, too much air, everything. Exactly. But, but you know, it, it, it lends itself to say that if you provide the body with correct information, it will be a self-healing miracle that continues in a healthy and optimal way till you're very old. But then there's the converse. If you provide the body with the wrong information, and what does that look like? And you could say blue light, but you could also say news these days which is a segue into what I want to ask you as a co-founder of Tip News and looking at so much of mental health being triggered and, and basically going in the wrong direction because of the wrong information, you could say, or, or how news portrays things. Tell us how you're trying to combat that with Tip News, which is an unbiased platform, news platform. Yeah, when we start to work in human health, environmental health, any of these things, as, as we've touched on, there are usually forces, uh, industries that have things set in a way that they enjoy, they appreciate. You know, we have people profiting, unfortunately, off of problems most of the time. And if you work in either of those spaces and you start to do something that doesn't align with those current modalities and ways of thinking, you're seen as a disruptor. You're, you're somebody that is not friendly to um, the institutions that are already in place. And so when I started as an activist, just learning about glyphosate and genetically modified foods, Many people know, you know, Monsanto was you know, pretty infamously demonized. They're now owned by Bayer. They bought them a couple of years ago. But um, they were not super happy about people learning about genetically modified foods or, or, or they weren't going to root on, you know, this movement of people saying, I want to know if my, my food is labeled. So we tried to actually get a, a bill passed to label foods um, if they had genetic engineering. We thought the public deserved to know if their food was, you know, altered genetically. What a wild concept. And when we saw, like, with all the grassroots efforts that we did, the way in which we were outspent um, by these industries, initially that, that campaign we worked on in California at the time, it didn't pass. We did set a, a wave in motion that led to much more awareness that is um, eventually it did change things and it changed, you know, the labeling, but we saw the powers, uh, the power of money and the power of special interests. Now in the same way, you know, when it comes to media, 
we know that over 90% of what we read or we watch or we listen to is controlled by about six companies. And so about 15 billionaires you know, run those companies. And it goes back to this idea of centralization versus decentralization. You know, nature does not reward centralization. It means it's more unstable, it means it's more uh, ripe for corruption. And it's not a, a big discovery right now that when we have, you know, special interests on one side of our news platform and other interests on the other, that we have this divisive media. You know, everybody's feeling it. Um, the politics of bias that are affecting what we hear and what we see and the ways in which headlines are written. You know, there was a golden era of journalism where you were just provided the facts and it was your responsibility as a reader to do what you wanted to with that. And the psychology of business and presenting media has rewarded the the bias because it's just an inevitable process that people want to hear what they believe right this is called confirmation bias and so we see this now with social media if anybody has watched the film the social dilemma we know that you know the algorithms are quite literally curated to give you more of what you already believe you know reinforce your vision of the world and with that's going to come serious tribalism and with tribalism comes i'm the good guy they're the bad guy. How do we tap into the ego if we were you know, trying to get more clicks, trying to get more advertising dollars as a news station or um, an article and a headline and clickbait online? You want to tell people what they want to see. It's very rare these days for people to seek out things that contradict their beliefs. No one wants to be proven wrong, right? It's just built into our psychology of our ego. And so these news companies, they know that. And we've watched, like, especially over the last couple of years for a number of reasons, as these tribes become more and more divided, but also more and more aggressive in their blame or their belief that it's really we're in trouble because of those other people on the other side. And this illusion of binary where it's them versus us constantly. And if nothing else, it doesn't even have to get into some massive conspiracy theory. It's just that this is good business because you you click on these things and you are rewarded for, you know, reading this article and learning more about how, gosh, if everybody just thought like you, you know, we would be so much better. And unfortunately, this isn't leading us down a, a good path. A lot of people know this now. And I think the loudest voices are the ones that are on the extreme opposite ends. But really, the majority of people, whether it's Americans or even globally, I do think that they have a little bit more compassion for people that are different, um, that think differently, that live differently, that have different beliefs and cultures. They really don't mind um, as long as it's you know not affecting them or causing something dangerous. But this this yearning to come together, to have more compassion for your neighbor, to see the humanity in somebody who's arrived at a different conclusion, whether it's you know about their environmental beliefs, their medical beliefs, their political beliefs. So we said, how do we? How can we heal this? Um, is there something that is that is providing just the facts? And like with a lot of the the work that I've done, it was mostly just driven out of I wish this existed. I wish this was the the newsletter and the news that I was getting. So we started Tip News, and the idea is, you know, we're providing the most need-to-know details for people that are kind of fed up with, if I look at one news platform, it's it's so biased in one direction. You see the same headline bias in the other direction. But where is that middle ground? Um, and that respect for the reader is not really there anymore in mainstream news. It's, it's often telling people what to think. So a lot of people want to be told what to think, which I think is a habit that we have to get out of which is, you know what, why can't we just sit in the unknown a little bit? We don't have to know everything. We don't have to say, this is right, that is wrong. It's the humility of just saying, all right, tell me what happened. And why, why do, I don't need an opinion necessarily on every single topic. So Tip News is, is, has been really great in that we have people from both sides of the political spectrum that we've seen that feedback of that they appreciate that we're stripping out a lot of the bias. And really, it's, it's fear-mongering. 
right? Our brains are hardwired to notice if something's dangerous and to pay more attention to that. And so any way that we can reduce, you know, this intentional fear mongering and sensationalism and political agenda, uh, that's, that's the goal. So that's the mission. So we've created this really cool free newsletter at tip.news. Anybody can check it out. And, um, you know, we want to be held accountable. That's the beautiful thing is we're, we're an independent company. We're not, you know, tied to the interests of, for one, big pharmaceutical companies, big chemical companies, or big companies from any industry, oil companies, you name it, that have interests and control and influence sitting on the boards, literally, of, of media companies and making sure that they report in certain ways. You know, that stuff is very real. Um, no theories needed. It's just business incentive, you know, to have people speaking well on your behalf and to run ads for you. And so, you know, we're, we're doing our best um, to, to try to create the most unbiased news platform there is. And uh, it's a big mission, but it's, it's come at a time when most people are abandoning legacy media. Yeah. They know that they've lost their trust and there's really no way for them to get it back. No way, no matter how much they, they scramble and try to rebrand uh, it's, it's just, it's corporate interests and it's the same monopolies that are, that are at the heads of those pyramids. And so trying to do something different. And I think that that's a big piece of mental wellness, you know, as, as we look at healing our culture is, you know, how are we participating and staying in the know on things? Because for a while, a lot of people just stopped watching the news or, or still don't. Because it's like, I can't watch it. It's so depressing or it's so clearly a narrative. And so unless you want to just be completely living under a rock and not knowing what's going on, which is unfortunately kind of the only option in, in many ways until, you know, other independent sources like ours start to help provide the news in a really easy to read way without, you know, you know, jamming these, these yeah. divisive narratives down our throats. Yeah, it's it's really important, especially when you look at it from that mental health aspect, because most most of these biased news stations are are selling fear porn in some ways, you know, trying to keep you scared, using narratives that keep you in a certain state of fear, anxiety, uh, glued to the television because you get addicted to fear. But fear is terrible. And I was reading this on the news, but, uh, you know, it, it was basically saying that now ER rooms aren't overwhelmed by people who are infectious disease, let's say, but who have mental health issues yeah. who are coming to hospitals with suicidal ideology, with anxiety. That's awful. And it's usually kids. They're saying, you know, it's, they're the most impacted by it. And, you know, kids don't need that kind of fear. Like kids should be looking forward to a life that that is something you know worth living for and and very happy about that uh, you know it's it's a sad sad state when you have kids yeah. run into the ER thinking they want to kill themselves right yeah and and you got to look not just at the news of course social media everything else going on out there but then you got to look at the generation that's bringing them up and what what our roles and responsibilities are to the younger generation that's having such a tough time so so when yeah I mean tip news yeah. sounds like a, a good counterbalance in some ways, at least to that effect. You know, all of these things I, I do think have kind of a through line of this, this longing for connection because kids these days, you know, for one, they, they, they often don't have a connection to the outside world. They right. don't have a connection to things that are biologically and physiologically, you know, helping to sustain their mental wellness. And this dopamine and overstimulation through these devices, whether TV, games, phones, it's not to demonize them entirely because they're nuanced. They bring, mm -hmm. you know, they can bring great things and they can bring connection. But at the same time, uh, it, they're kind of, we're hijacked, right? Our, our brains and, and our overstimulation is hijacked to the point where we start to learn, uh, we start to lose the skills of connection in, in the real world, the social skills. We don't have the same, you know, rites of passage as once were in, I think, in our culture. Um, so people, they don't know if they have a place and they're going to turn to, unfortunately, our system is, you know, it's designed to encourage just put, putting them on some of these psychotropic medications as young as, you know, in elementary school. And this, the mental health epidemic is, is really wild. 
And as an interesting, you know, reconnection to the soil thing, we, we know now that, you know, there's so many benefits to things like grounding, the electrical connection that we have to the earth when we put our hands in the soil. But there's also these bacterium in the soil that there's research that shows it helps regulate our serotonin production. So these things that we're talking about of, you know, whether it's how we consume news, whether it's the light that we're being exposed to or our interconnection and relationship to soil systems and how our food is grown, they really are the same conversation, even though they may seem like completely different topics, is that it's about returning us to nature. You know, it's about returning us to who we are and who we were designed to be. And that's how we're going to be optimized. We're not going to be optimized um, just sort of rewriting the script on how our bodies physiologically evolved. And so, the future is the past in terms of if we're going to do medicine right, if we're going to do agriculture right, sustainability right, technology right, communication, it's, you know, we need to go back to those basics because this is the only way. And in all of those things, we can call those unsustainable in that we're degenerating our relationships. We're degenerating, you know, the way that we communicate with our neighbors, or the way that we experience um, nature in any way. And so uh, I, I think the that is that is a beautiful thing is that the answers have been with us all along, right? The ancestral knowledge is really the key to the future. And it doesn't mean demonizing all technology. It's about having that that balance. And I think more people are, are seeing that. And the cool thing is, it's not just having to understand it intellectually, is that it's an experience. And when you do go out and you finally start those experiences, you start that positive feedback loop and that ball of momentum in the right direction that people want to feel good. You know, we actually want to feel better. Eventually we burn out from these kind of quick fixes and we realize that's not a long-term solution here. And um, returning back to these natural processes and the circadian rhythms, this it's all part of the same thing. Yeah. Nature is, is such a great solution to so many problems. But I also know you're a bit of a biohacker yourself, and there are other things in your toolbox of optimizing health. What are some of those things that you've seen really helped you with your, whether they be wellness practices, techniques, technology? Yeah, I love, I mean, I, meditation really saved my my brain and my mental health many years ago when I was probably at my darkest um, uh, in, in a bit of a depression. So I do think there's really cool meditation technologies now that actually use audio frequencies to help harmonize the, the sides of the brain. And when you listen to them in headphones, I think that's really powerful. Um, Qigong is a lesser known sort of sister to things like yoga and Tai Chi. I've, I've practiced that on and off for a while. I'm not an expert, but it does bring me peace. One thing that I think has been the biggest game changer is saunas, um, sauna therapy. So when I got an at-home sauna, I use one by a company called Sauna Space, which is really cool because it's grounded. The mat is grounded. It has an EMF protection, what's called a Faraday cage. It blocks outside signals. And you're also getting that red light therapy at the same time as the heat. And, you know, heat therapy and sauna, it, it, it does have a lot to do with this um, this element of fire that we were talking about with you know, pharmacy of light, how light works and how fire works, that this is kind of that same elemental principle where when we tap into these four elements, earth, air, water, and fire, uh, the heat piece is really powerful. And and then also, you know, the, the opposite end of the spectrum, the cold exposure, you know, we have these crazy studies, uh, jaw-dropping results from people that are exposed to sauna therapy and in longevity and reduction in and heart disease, and even similarly on the sunlight um, topic, you know, it's it's a form of that same heat energy. And there was a study in Sweden that showed, you know, I think they, I think it was like thirty thousand women that they followed for about twenty years, and the most sun exposure was the lowest mot mortality. They lived the longest, which is contradictory to what a lot of people are raised up to think to slather on all those chemical toxins to block the sun. Uh, God forbid, you know, this planet that we all evolved on that had a sun, you know, what what were we doing for those millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years <laughs> as humans without all that that sun cream? But um, the, the women who were most exposed to the sun was such a cool fact. And maybe you've you've heard this or your listeners have heard this was 
the, the, the women who were exposed to the most sun, um, even if they smoked, they did as well as the non-smokers in the lower sun exposure group, which points to, you know, light deficiency may be, according to that study and others, may be as negatively impactful as smoking. And think of all the campaigns that we hear about smoking and, you know, people have the freedom to, to do it if they so choose. But all that information that we now know about the harmful effects of smoking. Imagine if we had something like that about you got to get your sunlight exposure, a healthy dose, as we said, right? Everything in, in the right proportions. But imagine if that was part of our culture in a similar way, if that's what the data is showing. So sunlight um and connecting to to nature. I mean, I'm I'm you know I really try to practice it. The sun is not out very much where I live right now these days, which is a challenge. But uh, what I've found is these the red light therapy, um, some other vitamin D lamps that I use, um, and the sauna is really what keeps me through winter months. And uh, yeah, anybody that is not saunaing. You gotta, I don't know if that's the right verb, but you gotta, you gotta try it out. Um, you just get so much benefit in, in, in such a short time. And there's really nothing like it that shows the, to extend, um, lifespan and overall health quite like doing a sauna session. Yeah, no, I, I concur with that. And, uh, you know, the, the ROI on investment like that, because number one, most of the things you said, meditation, other things are, are zero input types of investments to get a lot in return, being sunlight and other things you could get in te technology. But the, the science is absolutely there with you know saunas, whether they are infrared or not even. Um, right. you, you can make cases for both and using both. But even people like Dr. James D. Nicolantonio, which I've had on a bunch, you know, just pushes all of that science. Like there is, you know, too much behind it now to say, all right, maybe it's still controversial. We don't know enough. You know, the whole we need more studies to figure out what it is like. No, there, there is so much benefit from detoxification to autophagy, like, you know, too much yep. there to say, uh, let's let's not do it. I think we have to put ourselves in places of some stress like we do with cold or hot therapy in a sense to make us stronger like people yes. people always get this they get the gym you go to the gym you have to work hard you feel like crap the next day because you're all sore and everything but that's how you get bigger right that's how you have to rip the muscle actually you have to stress the body to become better stronger faster quicker all that and yet we we only think of that in terms of the gym usually you know, that we will sacrifice like, you know, no pain, no gain. Yet we don't do it in all, in all other aspects. We try to avoid that. We don't want the headache. So we go right to the, you know, the pain relievers that are toxic. We don't want to sweat. So we put on antiperspirants with, you know, aluminum in them. We always go for these fatal convenience uh, conveniences, as Darren Olean puts it. Uh, you know, and avoid it when in reality, those types of stressors are so, so impactful on our health. So I, I love that toolkit. It's very foundational. It's not too much, right? Because sometimes it's overwhelming what some people do to, uh, you know, hundreds of pills and all the gadgets and everything. So that was an amazing one. Rob, where can people learn more about you and all the projects you're involved in? Yeah, so there's earthconsciouslife.org. And that is kind of our umbrella platform for the, the films and the other work that we do. The need to grow.com is, is where you can find out more about uh, the film about agricultural solutions and regenerating our soil. It's very inspiring human driven story. It's not quite uh, just a, you know, a boring soil story or about farming. It, there's quite a few twists and turns. Uh, it's more of a hero's journey. So if you haven't seen that, I really highly recommend that you check it out. And tip.news is where that news platform is. And anybody can join that for free. And um, yeah, we've got a couple more things coming over time with other films. And we, we do have something about the gut brain axis and mental wellness that we're working on as well. So more to come, but it'll all be at earthconsciouslife.org. Amazing. We'll put up links for all of that. Rob, thank you so much for your work and coming on today. It's been a pleasure. And, and likewise to you, you know, thanks for helping people share the, the passions and, and the journey that they're on to hopefully inspire more people to get 
um, get into the participation of it really is all it is. You know, you, you will feel better, whether that's environmentally or on your human health. So I appreciate people like you that are, that are helping us uh, with this platform. Thank you. Thank you. So as you heard, the future of our health and the health of our planet is in our hands. We have power, people. Do we have what it takes to change our society and our world for the better? That's, that's up to us. Until next time, keep writing your own healing story.